Good. Yeah, today, uh, as Jerry already announced, I will talk a bit uh, about quality assurance in X-ray absorption spectroscopy, especially about um, measures that could be taken to, to improve the comparability of SUFS measurements among different beam lines and uh, about a round robin test, which is planned to be held in, in the nearer future to um, help improve uh, this comparability. So the agenda is, um, um, I will start a bit with the history of this undertaking, then um, uh, talk a bit about quality assurance. I'm, I'm myself an analytical chemist, so I, I did my PhD in analytical chemistry. So this is much more familiar to me than, um, than the hard physics and the theory behind um, all these things. Um, so I'm, I, I want to, to introduce some concepts from um, analytical chemistry. Then I will talk um, especially about round robin tests and uh, exact round robin test and um, tell a bit about the status uh, of this exact round robin today. Good. I should start with the people who are involved because this is definitely not. Um, um, I'm, I'm definitely not the person who did all this work. Uh, there are many other people's um, people who. who did uh, much more work than I did. And um, my, my special thanks go to Hiroyuki Oyanagi, who um, organized the first q 2 subs workshop, um, uh, more or less exactly 10 years ago. And uh, to Sophia, uh, who organized a third q 2 subs workshop in 2017. Then uh, we must mention Chris Chandler, who was the driving force behind a paper which we published um, in the Journal of Synchrotron Radiation in which we were calling for a round robin test uh, for synchrotron beamlines or for XAPS beamlines specifically. And I must also thank all the other uh, co-authors of this paper, Matt Neuville, um, who is also working on a solution for XAPS Spectra database, which will play a role in this talk. And um, Hitoshi Abi and Masuo, Masao Kimura, who um, um, gave a lot of information about a Japanese round robin initiative, and uh, I've seen Hitoshi in in the audience, which is which is really brave undertaking because I think it's about two o'clock in the morning in in Japan, and and Bruce Banker, who also um, worked together with us on this paper and gave a lot of valuable contributions to it. Good. The q 2 um, the first workshop was actually in Tsukuba, uh, organized by Hiroyuki Oyanagi in 2011, in December 2011. Initially, it was planned to be in March uh, 2011. That's exactly 10 years ago. And you might remember there was uh, this terrible earthquake um, in March. And uh, I think the workshop uh, was planned to be a week or so later and uh, well it, it was postponed after all the uh, things that happened but fortunately it was possible uh, to have this workshop in December. Then there was a second workshop uh, which was organized in Hamburg and uh, a third workshop as a, a second workshop was a satellite meeting of the XAFS conference in Karlsruhe and the um, third workshop which was organized um, at Diamond in 2017. Um, there are papers which came out of these workshops, kind of proceedings, and especially this workshop in 2017 turned out to produce several papers which were um, published in the Journal of Synchrotron Radiation in, the, in 2018. And, and one of these papers was this call for a round robin test. And well, the question is, will there be a fourth q 2 xafs workshop? I don't know. At the moment, it's it's a bit hard to, to predict. Uh, personally, I would I would really like to, to have another one, um, maybe also as a kind of satellite meeting to the next XAFS conference. Um, the topics and these workshops were um, XAFS database, uh, what can we do, uh, how can we store XAFS data, similar to, to what's uh, common in, uh, in X-ray diffraction. Uh, there, there are huge databases uh, with experimental data. Um, could we do something comparable to that? But then in which format, the data format is uh, important, ASCII or HDF5 or, or something completely different. 
the metadata uh, that needs to be stored, this can be endless discussions. And, and then there are talks about standardization, characterization of beam lines, um, standard operating procedures to prepare, how to prepare samples, how to, how to do a XAFS measurement, and uh, also about a round robin test. And um, there were also, uh, for sure, talks about data evaluations, about software, especially for quick scanning access and a huge amount of data. Error reporting is, is very important. But um, yeah, also there were beginnings of, of these discussions uh, whether it would be possible to uh, automatize um, the data evaluation to, to avoid human bias uh, a bit more. And we had a, a very nice talk, I think, three, four weeks ago by Jeff Terry about this in, in this series of talks. And, and there were also talks by Yanis, Yanis uh, Timoshenko and his colleagues about machine learning approaches. So this will not be the purpose of this talk. And uh, we will not talk about data evaluation. And I will not talk about data evaluation in this talk. Actually, the story is, is much, much older. It's, it's almost 25 years now since um, the International XAF Society Standards and Criteria Committee was founded. I think the founding um, uh, meeting was in Seattle in, in August 1997. So yeah, almost 25 years ago. There was a report coming out of these uh, activities. It was published in 2000 by uh, Dale Sayers. And um, this work group was divided into three subgroups. One was uh, um, thinking about beam lines and, and what, uh, how the experiment could be improved. Uh, then a data analysis, analysis subgroup and error assessment and reporting subgroup. And in this report, uh, which reports about all these three um, fields, there is already a mention of um, a round robin test um, and in this beamline subgroup. There's written later this subgroup will develop and undertake performance test at facilities around the world. I think uh, 25 years after that is, is late enough and uh, we should uh, really do something in, in that field. Okay, let me briefly go through some, some terms, um, some, some analytical terminology, um, just, yeah, uh, just to be sure that, that we are always talking about the same thing. So in analytical chemistry, um, there are some, some terms defined which uh, all deal with, with quality uh, aspects of, of analytical data. And well, I think the most uh, important one is the accuracy that uh, means the closeness of the agreement between an analytical result and the accepted reference value, which is interesting because there's not written the true value, it's the accepted reference value. And um, then comparability, which is important. You, want to, you don't want to do each analysis on your own because you want to trust other laboratories and you want to trust laboratories which are somewhere else in the world and, and not in in Germany or in the US or wherever uh, where you live. And um, for that, it's important that um, something like traceability is established so that we all mean the same if we say a distance is one or two or three angstrom, um, that this um, is all traced back to the meter standard, which was in the old days, uh, this platinum iridium rot in, in Paris and which is now the wavelengths of, of some um, emission line or defined via the wavelengths of, of some emission line. Reproducibility, that's the um, precision um, under the condition that uh, the same that uh, the same sample is investigated in um, um, with the same method um, in, in different uh, laboratories. Um, then repeatability, that means the precision under the condition that um, the same test is performed in the same laboratory by the same people in principle and, and you always get the same result or within some uh, distribution you get the same uh, results. Uh, and this distribution is called the precision um, that uh, gives um, measure of 
um, the, um, the spread of your results. Then selectivity and specificity is not that important today. Um, I mean, EXAFS is uh, a message which is a specific, element specific, which uh, makes a difference if we compare to XRD, for instance, where you get the diffraction pattern from everything that's crystalline and that's in your sample. And in our case, we look at one element and uh, with um, under certain conditions, even on, on certain species, if we choose um, the right mode of detections. And then robustness means um, that a method is not uh, very sensitive to, to more or less large disturbances from, um, from, from errors or whatever. So precision accuracy is, uh, I think, uh, very nicely shown. Uh, the meaning in, in these graphs here, it's, it's the kind uh, you, when you shoot with a rifle or whatever on, on these uh, marks uh, here. And uh, well, low precision means uh, you, your, your hits are spread over a relatively large area, but you might still get a high accuracy. So um, if this is distributed around the center of uh, of the target, but um, you might combine low precision also with, with low accuracy when the spread is um, is far from the center of the target. But having a high precision doesn't mean that you have a, a high accuracy at the same time because your small spread um, of events can be completely off the center. So. Um, this is something you can't, well, you can test um, in a single laboratory. Um, you, um, the precision is relatively easy. You calculate the standard deviation. The accuracy, you might test uh, by using reference materials, um, in the best case certified reference materials, and um, to test whether this is the, the distribution of of results among different laboratories. You obviously need uh, to test the results or to, to have the results from, from different laboratories and compare them. And this is basically what's behind this round, round robin test. So I'll come to that later. Good comparability and traceability. Well, you have uh, some, you have two synchrotrons. One is round and then the other one is an oval. And um, you measure the exof spectrum of a sample. I think this was copper foil or whatever, usually. Then this data goes into a black box and uh, you do the evaluation of your data and you come out with numbers. And uh, well, within error margins, they are the same. But the question is how are these numbers, which are given in angstrom, so that's a length unit. And uh, somehow there must be a relation to a meter or length standard, um, which is somewhere or defined in, in some way. So how is this uh, traceability established? Good. The reliability of, of XAPS results is influenced by, by, by many factors. Um, the absorption, if we stay on, on the y-axis for a moment, the absorption axis is influenced by the linearity of the detectors, by, by all kinds of noise, um, higher harmonics content, homogeneity of the beam, the distribution of intensity in the beam, homogeneity of the sample, the monochromator resolution, and, and certainly a lot more factors. The energy axis, um, the x-axis is uh, influenced by stability and the repeatability uh, of your monochromator, the calibration of your monochromator, the linearity of uh, whatever you use, um, goniometer and, and the energy axis, and the resolution, obviously, of your monochromator. And then all this goes into the um, data evaluation, but as I said, um, we don't want to talk about this today. So I have a brief look at the calibration of uh, monochromator. And that's something interesting. I, I stumbled about this when I prepared this talk. Uh, well, we all know, we, we all use uh, the values uh, from this orange book, uh, which is rather old uh, now in the meantime. 
uh, but these values are used everywhere. We all know that these values are wrong and um, they are uh, by one, two, three electron volts wrong from, from um, or deviate by, by one, two, three electron volts from values which are more precise be measured um, in the past. So there was um, a work in the late 1990s uh, which was done at uh, also done at Doris at B9L um, in those days and uh, uh, two guys um, Kraft and Stümpel they um, measured the um, position of absorption edges with a very precise uh, setup using a crystal as um, wavelength standard and, and uh, calculated the energy by this and they came to values which deviate uh, more or less significantly from the values in this orange book. Actually if, um, if you're a beamline scientist and you want to make your life a little bit easier you would use these values to, to calibrate your monochromator because um, it means that really all these values if you have a precise um, encoder and you can measure the theta angle very precisely, all these values will be on a line. Whereas if you use uh, the values from, from the orange book, they scatter somehow around this line. So um, using the, the values from the orange book means uh, you go from vanadium to manganese and you need to recalibrate your monochromator because apparently you are some electron volts off simply because uh, the values in the orange book are wrong. Now, what makes this thing much more interesting is that in the Orange Book, um, they also say that they use um, the values uh, from a publication by Bearden et al., which was in Review of Modern Physics in, <laughs> in at that time, Modern Physics in 1967, so some years ago. And if you look into this publication, you find different values. It's, it's not the values that are in the orange book. I have absolutely no idea yet uh, why that is, but the values in the orange book are not the values which are tabulated by Bearden at all. This is for sure. Um, for instance, for vanadium, this is again, this is a table taken from this uh, Stümpel and Kraft publication. Um, uh, Stümpel and Kraft did, uh, uh, for vanadium found uh, 5,463 point. Um, seven six and uh, Bearden um, tabulated five thousand four hundred sixty four point zero. Actually, in Bearden there is uh, <laughs> five thousand uh, four hundred sixty three point nine. So there's also a small deviation, but I think this has something to do with this uh, recalibration of the of the value for for this um, angstrom uh, with a star. This is uh, way um, the wavelength was defined in, in the old days. It refers to um, the tungsten KFR one line, uh, to the wavelengths of the K tungsten KFR one line and Bearden used, um, said uh, this alpha with a star is equal to one angstrom, uh, angstrom with a star is equal to one angstrom, whereas um, Stümpel, uh, Stümpel and Kraft um, used uh, this value which is shown here, which is slightly different. So I think that explains uh, the small deviation of tens of an electron volt, but definitely doesn't explain uh, why um, there is this deviation uh, between 5,465 and 5,464.0. So I have no idea what this is, uh, but, but there is definitely a problem with traceability if, if you use uh, these values. Good. The instrumental, well, which uh, components of a beamline uh, contribute to the uncertainty in such results, uh, I would say any component. You can start with the source um, undulator gaps or whatever you use as a source, but, but undulators are nasty sources for, for exhausts definitely, so the bending magnet is, is definitely more, uh, much more benign. Um, orbit instabilities in the ring, uh, spatial homogeneity of, of your beam, of your source, again something that uh, is mainly important for, for um, uh, undulators. Then uh, your optics, vibrations, high harmonics, energy calibration of the monochromator, the detectors, linearity, electronic noise, amplification factors, uh, cables, the sample, are, well, I'm a beamlight scientist, I would say the sample is uh, the worst thing, uh, usually it's a sample. Okay, 
what can we do to to improve um, the situation a bit or to do the best we can at the moment that's simply following this good laboratory practice uh, rules so um, we try to, to use standard operation procedures, although we might not call it like this, but we tell our users, prepare the samples in a certain way, do this, do that, um, do the measurement in a certain way, use this or that step size. Uh, so all these are in principle standard operating procedure, although they might not be written down in, in a formalized way. We check um, the repeatability using internal standards, the repeatability of, of our energy access and, and other things, the long-term stability. And um, well, if we want, we might use um, certified or not certified reference material to test the accuracy. So when I, when I measure a cup of oil, do I get uh, the right result? Do I get the right bond lengths or not? And then, we might in the future do some um, inter-laboratory tests by comparing results from different beam lines and trying to figure out um, which parameters influence the position. When we compare the situation we have with EXAS with the situation you normally have in an analytical lab, there, there is uh, a complication in case of EXAS and that's that the responsibilities are divided. Um, if you have um, if uh, you, you have an EXAFS beamline, you, you operate the beamline and you do the best you can and uh, the users come and they do also for sure the best they can, but they bring their samples. So the users are um, responsible for the quality of the samples. And um, that's really, as everyone knows, a very, maybe even the most important factor, the quality of, of the sample. And uh, so there's shared responsibility and, and not all the problems we have or might have with data quality can be solved by, by the beamline or by the beamline staff. But also we should never forget um, for many applications, all the things I just mentioned are not that important. If um, many, many applications of XAPS are of that sort, which is shown here in situ experiments where, um, where the spectra are followed over time or with changing temperature or any other parameter that's changed. And um, uh, well, then you see that something is happening. So it's the same instrument, it's the same sample, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, all these things are not that important and uh, you don't need to make all this effort. Good, yeah, now I'm my mistake here. Okay, round robin tests. Um, before we come to the first question, maybe I should briefly, round robin is, is uh, for, um, uh, well, it's it's an interesting word, and uh, in German it's called Ringversuch, which is much more descriptive. Uh, so I try to find out what round robin comes from. Um, it seems it uh, has a French uh, root um, and uh, means round ribbon in English, and uh, this it's about. Um, yeah, petitions, memorials, protests, uh, sailors complaining about the food or whatever. And um, to avoid that, uh, that one of these sailors was identified as a leader of this uh, complaint and uh, was held responsible for, for this complaint, maybe drawn up the gallows, I don't know. Um, the, this method of uh, signing this petition in a circular way was invented. So it seems this is the, um, the root of this uh, term round robin. Okay, for us in analytical chemistry means um, a sample, identical samples are sent to different laboratories. Each of these laboratories uses um, the methods it's standard methods to analyze a certain parameter, a certain content of something in the sample. And then the, the outcome of this, the results of this are compared and one can try to, um, to improve um, the comparability uh, between, um, between different laboratories, which is maybe use different methods or the same method, but in any case, different equipment. Uh, to do the experiment and, and see if there are factors which 
um, it had an influence on, on the result. So, yeah, and I think this is a, a good place uh, to start, um, yeah, to have uh, some questions before I go into the XAFs round robin. Very good. It's a terrific start. Um, uh, to begin, uh, Jeff Terry, you have a question? Jeff, are you uh, muted? Yeah, I'm unmuted. So my, my question was just, has this been published? Have those new edge positions been published somewhere? And somebody answered in the chat already. So they put the reference in, so everybody should feel free to look in the chat window to see the the, the reference. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, another question is, um, uh, you've been, excuse me, largely talking about um, uh, very general considerations for, uh, uh, for example, entire XF spectra. And something that I think could happen in coming years is, uh, for example, through mail-in facilities um, at synchrotrons, which I think are going to stay uh, to some extent after COVID, we might see an increase in industrial use which opens the question of quality control in the context of say regulatory compliance. And so I was wondering if you know of much work on standard test methods um, uh, that have been uh, internationally certified that use XFs and any similarities or differences between that process and what you're trying to do with QTZFs. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I think this, uh, this is um, from my point of view, a strong motivation to, um, uh, to undertake uh, this, uh, because um, we we are always trying to convince industrial users to use our facilities, um, because it it's good to sell uh, what we are doing. And um, but I don't know um, of any. I think we we must do it the other way around. We we must start with this and then um, tell the industry, okay, we we try to. Um, uh, we, we try to go into a system where, where quality assurance and, and uh, formalized procedures for quality assurance are established. And, uh, it's, inter it's interesting is the process for getting a certified standard test method um, uh, takes a couple of years working with one of the international societies that, that documents that. And... Um, um, uh, for example, determining chromium-6 fraction in mineral ores and mine tailings would be something that uh, uh, would be of, of substantial interest, but there has to be the effort put in up front to go through the documentation process. So anyway, I just wonder if that might be uh, uh, something that could be done in parallel by a community of, uh, of people in, um, in the XAS community in parallel to the, the broader questions of beamline reproducibility and so on. Yeah. Um, maybe that's more of a comment than a question. I apologize. <laughs> um, uh, we do have a, a question from Neil Hyatt. Thank, thanks, Jerry. Th thanks, Edmund. Really interesting talk. Um, to, to type my question would take ages, so <laughs> I'm just going to ask it. Um, I'm a slow typer. Um, so, so just thinking about kind of um, reference compound databases. So, you know, if we're working in diffraction, we're used to like PDF or ICSD, where you can see the quality of a pattern and you're more likely maybe to trust a, a starred pattern of quality than the one that's not, or, or think about why you might kind of use that as a reference compound. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about um, how what you're talking about could be applied to sort of quality assessment of reference patterns for databases, whether there's any kind of AI tools I'm afraid I missed the talk and I'll have to catch up from the other week, whether there's any AI tools that could be applied to sort of test quality in a way um, to, to assign a, you know, a kind of discriminator or metric. I, I, I think I will mention these things briefly in, later in, in, in my talk. Um, definitely a database would be most helpful uh, for, for many um, aspects. Um, and um, <clears throat> but, but, well, as always, there are, there are endless discussions, uh, how and where and who um, should set up uh, a database, uh, should every EXAFS uh, user who publishes a paper where EXAFS is involved uh, also publish the 
data in some form, the raw data in the best case. Uh, what's necessary if we if we publish the raw data to make use of this raw data? I mean, we all don't know this little database and how difficult it is sometimes to figure out what's, what's really in these three columns. Um, sometimes it's, it's extremely difficult. And so what, what's necessary? And, and that, um, that until now is my understanding was uh, was a problem and, and for some reason or i guess uh, one of the reasons why it's much more established in in the diffraction community is that um, xrd device uh, lab device is standing almost everywhere so there are much more users and and maybe well maybe it was uh, when the benchtop xafs uh, becomes uh, successful becomes a success and it more and more people have a uh, uh, a bench stock stuff in their in their basement in their lab. Um, maybe then the same dynamics uh, will, uh, will will come. <laughs> I, I don't know, uh, but but I will definitely uh, come back to this uh, database uh, at the end of, of my talk. Sorry, I was muted for a second. All right, that's the questions for the moment. You should continue, Edmund. Good, right. Good, except round robin test. So it's it's from my point of view, it's mainly about comparability. And um, funny enough, uh, just some days ago, there was in the IFFET mail list, uh, there was there were several mails, and it was basically a more technical question, uh, if I understand, uh, stood it correct. Um, it was the question how to um, how to correct shifted energy scales using large and uh, Matt answered to this question and um, well what he said is that it should be possible to group the data from one run from one beam line maybe from one day into um, yeah to, to have groups of, of this data and then align these groups of data to a common standard but with the uh, what he also said this should be hopefully all data from a day or more of beam time at a particular beam line and i think this particular beam line this is completely correct it describes the current uh, situation completely correct um, but what would he would we say if uh, this answer comes uh, for the results of a doping test or for, for pesticides in 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 food uh, for, for any other analytical result. So we would say, well, you're crazy. This uh, can't be. The result cannot depend on the lab where, where this um, number was produced. So this um, very briefly for me summarized the motivation for Xafs Round Robin, this uh, uh, mails in the IFFIT list. Good. And um, that's, I think, the background why um, the IXAS and also the IUCR's Commission on XAFs uh, decided uh, to publish this uh, call for a round robin test. That's um, more or less, I would say, now like two years ago or so. Things are the progress is, is not always very fast, but at least we have this call for XAFs round robin test, which, from my point of view, is, is very important that these two um, institutions are standing behind this because. Um, what I would really like to avoid is that the impression exists that this is the, uh, the idea of, of um, a certain institution or a certain beamline scientists who wants to compare beamlines. Uh, so this is definitely not the intention and I hope uh, that this is promoted by the adoption of, of this initiative by these two institutions. How could the XAFS round robin test look like? Uh, well, a sample is, and I will come uh, to the sample in a moment, is sent uh, to different uh, laboratories, that means to different uh, beamlines. At each beamline, um, the, the samples are measured, the, the spectra of these samples are measured. Uh, with the procedures which are usually used at that beam line. I think this is extremely important that there's not a deviation from, from the usual uh, proceedings, uh, but that each beam line is doing really what they are doing every day. Then they measure these samples and uh, collect the data and uh, send it 
to some repository, either at the moment via email or uh, deposit it in a Xafs data library. I, I will come to that in a, in a moment. Um, all these spectra should be measured as far out as possible because we all know the um, most interesting differences are certainly in those regions where the signal becomes weaker. Um, this was also shown by a Japanese round robin, um, which was um, done some years ago. And uh, there were marked uh, differences visible in, in spectra of titanium dioxide at K larger than 12. <clears throat> and uh, well, for, for the first round, everything should be measured at room temperature, but um, later maybe we might also have a look at the influence of um, low temperatures, especially of, of low temperature. And if it's possible or if it's permitted by the contributors, it would be nice to store all this data in a database to start with uh, the spectra in the database then we would end up with uh, with a set of spectra of the same samples measured at several different facilities that could be useful to test the robustness of uh, evaluation procedures and, and all these things so that uh, could definitely be useful behind uh, the, uh, the evaluation of the round robin itself. So in the first stage, we were thinking about metal faults because um, they are widely available. They are ideal samples. Um, you can buy them in almost um, any thickness um, that's needed. They are very homogeneous. Uh, so the influence of the sample on the result will be very small. And um, it's uh, then really concentrating on, on the beamline and on the parameters of the beamline. They're stable if you choose the right metals, they're stable and, and easy to handle. In the second stage, there might be powder samples, which are much more realistic and, and add a lot of um, complications, but, but also interesting uh, questions, uh, what the influence of, of inhomogeneous samples, of inhomogeneous beams and, and all these things. Um, and in the third stage, well, that, that could be a third or fourth or whatever stage. Uh, one can think about very diluted samples, about uh, checking um, the influence of radiation damage on samples at, under different conditions, etc., etc. So the, for the first round, as I said, uh, we um, were thinking about metal foils, mainly at the moment, uh, titanium, copper, and molybdenum. And uh, well, uh, the main reason is that this is covering um, the energy range which is accessible with most XAF beam lines. Uh, certainly this is also biased by, by what uh, most of the people who were involved in this are doing, uh, which is hard X-ray um, absorption spectroscopy. Um, so um, I, I admit we didn't look too much uh, on energies below this 5000 um, electron volts and uh, well, molybdenum is uh, usually reachable with the 111. So it's, it's um, uh, nice uh, that at almost all beamlines, all these three elements can be measured. Um, the um, heaviest element and the, the highest uh, energy that one can find is um, in, the, in the Goodfellow catalog, that is, is antimony and well, everything that's um, that's heavier than, than antimony, I think, I mean, all these lanternites, they are not stable in air. That's, that's a problem to have metal for standards of these elements. So there, there's a gap here where it's really difficult to calibrate a monochromator. Good possible outcomes uh, from this first round. Uh, well, hopefully one day there will be a lot of um, spectra. Someone has to look at these spectra and um, have a look, are they identical or not? If they are ident identical, well, that's nice because it means we all did a very good job. We, we did exactly the right thing at the beamline, but it would also be boring from the point of view of a uh, round robin. Maybe there could then be plans for more challenging Round robin, but well, no one expects that they are all um, uh, that they all look identical. This is um, the reason uh, why we do this, uh, want to do this. Um, so probably we we end up with no, they are not identical, and then it will be 
interesting to identify the reasons and to correlate beamline parameter or procedures with the artifacts that we observe. Or the, maybe artifact is not the right word with the differences uh, that we see between the spectra. Um, hopefully, we can distill a kind of benchmark spectrum out of this. It would be very helpful already to have um, these two or three um, spectra where everyone agrees, yes, this is what's, what's possible. And, and this is what a good monochromator should uh, deliver. Um, we can use these spectra to influence, um, uh, to, to investigate the influence of uh, these deviations on the parameters that we evaluate with, with different software, um, all these things. And we can hopefully learn some lessons uh, for a more demanding round robin test, which would then be probably with powder samples. Um, which metadata is useful? Which kind of samples might be useful? And, <clears throat> and hopefully there will also be a bit more formalized support by, by, this, um, by the IUCR and by the access. The objectives. Um, will be to uh, to compare the spectra preferably the raw data um, or maybe she over k uh, compare the energy scale spectral resolution reproducibility systematic errors glitches what what do we see there are there differences between different beam lines um, the influence of of this difference on the results and um, as i said um, um, maybe have ideas for for the next round robin. It's important that these results. Well, it's it's a lot of work uh, if it's finally uh, successful, and uh, so it should must be published in in some form, but but strictly anonymized. This is not a beamline ranking, and it's not intended as a beamline ranking by no one. And uh, but well, a publication should uh, contain some generalized uh, recommendations. Uh, of how yeah, different tasks, specific tasks uh, can be done. Uh, but what can we expect? Uh, that is again, uh, very thankful to, uh, for these uh, plots from, from the Japanese uh, round robin, uh, where you can see here in the spectra, small differences in the, in the Xanes region, which were attributed uh, to the slit uh, settings, which has an influence on the uh, resolution of the monochromator. This is what one would expect, uh, sure. And uh, this is what we can also expect to see in, in the spectra. So I don't think we will end up uh, with a situation that we find no differences between the spectrum. This is not very likely. Good. What's the status today? Um, today, uh, well, I uh, <laughs> some actually some one or two years ago already. I, I bought some metal foils, titanium, copper, and, and molybdenum. I cut these foils into pieces and, and put them into small boxes, and uh, started to um, to send them out to interested uh, people who are beamline scientists, colleagues. Um, sample distribution, yeah, this is, um, well, some samples are already on their way. Uh, seven samples are already in the USA. Um, I uh, gave Matt Neville six samples when I was in Chicago one and a half year ago or so, when it was still possible to travel. I think Jerry has one uh, he picked up when he was here at Daisy. So this is very nice because it avoids all the bureaucracy with, with customs and, okay. I sent one uh, to Hitoshi Abe in, in Japan uh, just lately. I, I heard from him that it arrived. Uh, so actually it took more time here on the site uh, to fill out all these forms. I, among other things, I, I had to uh, declare that um, roughly a, centimeter squared of titanium is not helpful in building um, explosive nuclear devices. So um, this, this is some bureaucracy if it's outside of the EU, but it's, it's, uh, it can be handled. So um, I have still a lot of these boxes in my office. So if someone is interested, send me an email or 
anything, um, contact me somehow and, and I will be happy to, to send you one of those. Um, Good. This is a list of the metadata which we compiled so far. And uh, when I looked at it, I see it's it's again biased by what most of us are doing. For uh, it's in case of source, there's for instance underlater wiggler bending magnet, but there is no tube, uh, no bench top. Um, so it would be great if this list is simply added uh, by um, the contributors uh, of this round -trail. And if someone thinks um, that something, some important information is missing or we simply yeah, we forgot something, uh, just add it. This will be extremely useful for, for second round of round robin tests. And yeah, collecting the spectra, I, I already mentioned the two options. One would be uh, to use email and uh, to, to mail it uh, to me or to this um, special email address here. The other, and from my point of view, preferable uh, option is to deposit it in Matt Neville's uh, X-ray absorption data library. And um, this is some, some effort that Matt undertook uh, in the last years. Uh, that thing is working. Um, it is most useful, I would say, if uh, contributors use this XDI format, uh, there, there are instructions on the web page uh, can be found um, um, how this XDI format is working. It's an ASCII format and um, it's, a, it's a certain way to, um, to, to have the metadata in the, in the data file. And uh, that, that's very useful. It's working. Um, unfortunately, no one is storing um, the data from the beamline in the XDI. I, I wrote a small uh, Perl, uh, not Perl, uh, Python script that's converting the data from my beamline into this XDI format. Uh, that uh, and once you have something like this, this is really straightforward, and then it's relatively easy to uh, to upload the spectra there. That would be very very useful. And you see, there are many elements still missing here. Um, so only the there are only spectra for the blue ones. So there's a lot of work to be done, but that could be very, very useful to have this. And uh, when you download a spectrum from this library, it looks like this. Uh, you already see the spectrum, the raw spectrum and, and the Xanx region. And uh, what could be done with, with spectra like this, I try to show here. This is a spectrum. This is a spectrum from the uh, database in red and a very early spectrum from my beamline. And uh, you see there is, it's a copper foil as anyone can see here. And uh, you already see a problem here, an unexpected problem at that time. Uh, there, there was a problem with the resolution, which later turned out uh, to be a faulty mirror, uh, the reason for, for this problem. But um, yeah, this, things like this uh, would be very useful for anyone who um, wants to test his or her beamline. Good, and uh, to, to end with a very brief outlook, uh, proposal for a second round <clears throat> that um, would most certainly be powder samples. There's a very nice set of powder samples uh, available as certified uh, reference material, NIST uh, standards. It's containing titanium dioxide, chromium uh, trioxide, zinc oxide, and cerium dioxide. Um, this would expand the energy range up to 40 kef uh, for the cerium KH. Anyone else could measure the cerium LHs, um, beamlines which don't reach uh, these energies. Um, the cerium KH, as you can see here, especially cerium dioxide can yield very, very nice exof spectra up to a uh, really high K, so that would really make difference uh, well visible. And uh, these powders, uh, well, the NIST says that uh, they haven't tested it, but it's highly likely that they are stable and uh, under normal conditions in the laboratory. So they are ideal to, to send them around the world and uh, do the experiments on these uh, kinds of powders. Good, to summarize, um, I would say currently it's so that, that quality assurance is um, handled by the individual beamlines and their users. And uh, so they're isolated 
places in the world where, where everyone is doing the best he or she can do and um, to, to tackle this problem. Um, there are no, well, there are agreed standards uh, in, in the form of this orange book, but it's faulty, as we all know. Um, and therefore, it's proposed uh, a round robin test uh, to, to test the comparability and to improve the comparability of results from different laboratories. And uh, well, we tried to start the first round um, of this round robin test with metal foils, and yeah, would be happy to to send interested um, uh, beamline uh, scientists or beamline managers um, these samples. And uh, a second uh, round of round robin tests uh, would certainly contain powder samples, more realistic samples than, than just foils, and would certainly be much, much, much more interesting. So yeah, please contact me if you're interested uh, to participate in in these tests, and um, that that would be great. Um, and yeah, with that, I would like to thank you for for your patience, and uh, yeah, hope you have some questions. Thank you, Edmund. There's definitely questions. Um, uh, we'll start with um, uh, Santiago. You have a question, or was it answered uh, in the second half? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, it's uh, quite interesting uh, the subject for us, I think, for the community. Um, I, I put uh, in the chat that uh, there is. Uh, somehow a uh, paper that uh, tried to do that uh, some years ago. And I think it was one conference paper on uh, Camerino, uh, 2010, I believe, or something. But uh, there, there was a round robin on, uh, on this, uh, uh, trying to do something uh, similar that you propose. And I, if you could send samples for series, we are uh, happy to particip participate in, in the experiment for the first uh, round robin. Uh, we, up to now, we are constructing and commissioning some beamlines, and then we will have uh, perhaps some data for the first beam like in the following month. And, um, perhaps I, I, I will contact you by email. And yeah, the yeah, sure. Question? Sure, uh, I, I just wrote, uh, noted, uh, yeah, please drop me a mail. Uh, I, but I also just noted down uh, that you're interested. And yeah, and great to see you uh, again. Uh, yeah. Um, I think we met at these uh, QTXFs uh, conferences at one of yeah. those. Uh, yeah. In 2017, yeah. Yeah, um, I exactly. I don't know. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, uh, well, I, I think what's a little bit respond, you, you don't try to compare beam lines. It's only for uh, um, use the usual procedure that uh, each one has to measure and then has the results and try to compare these results. That's the main idea. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the main idea to uh, to compare the results and and see try to identify um, factors or uh, yeah factors that uh, contribute to the differences between the results. Um, it's it's definitely not the purpose uh, to find. The best beamline, or to um, say, okay, uh, go to this or that beamline if you want to have a good copper spectrum. So, but the, the the purpose is uh, to find the factors that contribute uh, to these differences and and give every beamline the chance to um, to learn from from this. Uh, Very good, uh, Jeff Terry. You have a question. Yeah, so uh, I think you hit on a big point with your analytical chemistry background. A long, long time ago, I actually worked in an analytical lab, and we had very stringent QA, QC procedures. 
Um, every instrument was checked weekly to make sure that it fit within the QA, QC parameters of the, the device. But what was different is you had people working at the analytical lab who were responsible for making those measurements. At a synchrotron, you have different people coming in to make measurements all the time. And so my question is, how do you actually kind of mesh the two different operating modes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this <laughs> this this what is in, uh, exactly what, what I mean with these shared responsibilities. That this makes the situation much more complicated than it is an analytical lab, where where everything is in well, in principle, in one hand, there, there might be different people who are responsible for for different things, but there's one management, and um, so there's, there's a, there are clear responsibilities here. We have to deal with with new users uh, every other day, and and they come with their own ideas, and they come with their own samples, and uh, it, it's definitely much harder. So, um, uh, for and and well, <laughs> I also enjoy the way in which we are working. I mean, we we have much more freedom than. Uh, you have in, in an analytical lab. So this is also something I enjoy very much. And I'm, I'm always, um, I'm, I'm, I'm never sure if I want to, to live under all these rules or not. Um, but yeah, we, we should definitely try to work uh, in, in that direction that we can at least establish procedures for the beamline. I mean, the um, alignment of the beamline, the um, making sure that the calibration of your monochromator is, is correct and, and stable and all these things. This is a responsibility of the beamline manager, of the beamline staff. And um, that, I think, can, be, can also be formalized. Uh, there, there can be procedures implemented uh, to do that. And uh, to find out which would be the best practice, I think it, it would be very helpful to compare results from, from different places in the world. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, Konstantin Klementiev, you have a question? Hi, Konstantin. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, my camera doesn't work. You don't see me, do you? No. Okay, well, anyway, you, you, you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear yeah, me. okay. Yeah, um, so uh, when it comes to comparing data from different places, uh, you realize that uh, some data were measured quickly, uh, some maybe slowly, and uh, directly compare them is not that trivial. Uh, related to this is also flux. So at some beamlines, 10 to 10 photons per second in the sample, at some maybe 10 to 13, and corresponding troubles with uh, linearity of ionization chambers. Uh, so then, I mean, when you compare, you need to add some more dimensions, like flux or time would be one or two, and then maybe uh, focal size, because uh, maybe for powder samples, it also matters. So then the question is, uh, what are your thoughts in, in expanding the, uh, the data library in, in this, you know, multidimensional space? like, you know, having time involved or, or flux. So, I mean, then it becomes, you know, less and less trivial and more and more complex. <laughs> yeah. So then the, where, where, where it will go? So the, your thoughts. Uh, I think it, uh, well, I mean, all this information belongs uh, into this metadata part of, uh, of, of the data file. Um, so definitely uh, the, the time that was spent uh, measuring a spectrum, um, the incoming flux. Um, so th these are the things which are definitely on the list of, uh, of metadata, which are necessary to, to understand. And, and this hopefully is, uh, is a difference uh, to what we find in, in this lighter database uh, where, where there's almost no information, not even what's written in which column. And um, so, uh, but, but yeah, that's definitely uh, necessary uh, to have this data. And then we see how much uh, or which parameters are 
important um, to understand the differences be between the spectra. So Very good. I, I, for me, yeah. this, this first this first round robin with the uh, with the foils is mainly uh, about learning how how to do these things and and what might be um, what might be important and necessary. Um, okay. Last last question from um, uh, Burkhard. Uh, pardon me, Burkhard Beckhoff. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the nice talk and discussion. I have a question regarding the metal foils that you used in the first round robin, distributed pieces of them to various partners. Do you have any information about the lateral thickness homogeneity of the samples? As this might be an issue as on transmittance or fluorescence detection with respect to the different beam profiles or spectral purities at different beam lines. Um, you mean um, you mean how uh, whether I <laughs> have information? Well, these metal foils are used as they are delivered. In in this case, not by Goodfellow, but by um, Advent uh, Materials and uh, Advent Research Materials is the name of, of the company. So I don't know much more about, or I don't know anything more about these samples. They claim they are light tight, which is uh, usually something that's useful for, for exhaust because pinholes can be very a disaster for, for your spectrum. But um, I don't know more about the sample. So it it's, would be certainly, certainly be a, a good idea to, to measure spectra, more than one spectrum at different places of this foil and uh, see if, uh, if all these spectra are identical. But this is a problem I mean, metal foils, maybe apart from, from solutions of things, uh, apart from, from liquid samples, are the most homogeneous kind of samples that you can get. But, but there's definitely structure in, in these uh, metal foils from uh, the mechanics uh, which is used to, to produce them. Uh, maybe even you start to see some small crystallites. Uh, so there are. On, on a microscopical scale, they are definitely not homogeneous, as homogeneous as they look. But I think it's it's the best one can get, well, except maybe uh, liquid samples uh, for a start. 